and I'll turn on the recording. While we're waking, waiting for uh, our speaker, uh, Erica Chung, to show up and the rest of the class uh, a few minutes ahead of time, did you guys get to uh, look at the articles I sent and the women in tech articles that Sophia and Fiza had assigned? I was just wondering if they'd done a good job covering and explaining what happened in Theranos. <clears throat> Do you guys, can you tell me, uh, who can tell me about the Theranos case? What happened? Just in a, in a summary. Oh yeah, and please take a few moments and turn on your video if you're online so I can see you all. I don't I don't necessarily expect you to keep them on, but at least let me see that you guys are there. Hey Johnny. Brian. Ian. Stephen? <clears throat> Hi. Jody, Colin, Skyler, turn on your videos briefly. Oh, yeah, Brian, just keep it on for a few minutes until we can get everybody here. Can anybody tell me what the Theranos case was about? Guys? Oh, yeah. What's, uh, what's the... Yeah. Oh, can Go you hear ahead. me? Okay. I, I, can I, hear I don't you. know that much about it, but I, I think I, I like watched a YouTube video on it once and it was like, uh, it, it's like this um it was like a way to examine blood right it, that's what the technology was supposed to be it was like it's like a startup company and the it was supposed to be able to uh uh like really cheaply and easily uh get access to machines that can uh examine your blood for different things um and it was it's like notorious for uh leading investors on and uh like telling them what they want to hear kind of for a number of years um yep it's, supposed to be it's like, called fraud yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and like the uh, what was it? The lady who like ran the whole thing. She was a uh, Elizabeth was, Holmes. Uh huh. And she uh, she like modeled her whole like personality and everything off off of like Steve Jobs. It's gonna be like the next Apple. But yeah, I don't know. Right. That. I just know it was a huge uh, blunder because they uh, yeah on the technology side. Yeah. Mm hmm. It was. You know. And I gave you guys a couple of articles to read about it, and I think maybe a YouTube video. <clears throat> uh, let's see now. Yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, those of you who signed in, can you turn on your videos so I can see you? Thank you. Oh yeah, I just wanna say, I Oh, sorry. I just want to say uh, I, I I didn't get to the readings. I, I actually uh, I thought I just thought we were doing the the week seven module, but I know I, I forgot about that. Yeah. Anyway, sorry about that. I, I yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't put it in the module. I just sent it out as an announcement. Um, <clears throat> but the articles are really good. They give a great background about what happened in a timeline did uh, in the Theranos case. So thank you for the summary, Colin. <clears throat> and uh, I, you know, Erica has been, she's a colleague and a friend, and she's an on, she's an advisory board member of the Center for Applied, uh, for our Center, for uh, Center for Applied Ethics and Values and Emerging Technologies. One of the things that uh, we need to work on is get the website up and more functional 
it's in WordPress right now. Um, WordPress, I don't know if any of you have had to deal with WordPress, but it's really, um, it's a pain. I'll just put it that way. Have any of you ever had to deal with WordPress? Any experience dealing with field WordPress? No. <clears throat> Did you get to, uh, I'm hoping at least some of you read the article the articles I sent on um, uh, from Wired magazine about how the whole Elizabeth Holmes Theranos case was all being mansplained. <laughs> yeah, you know, and uh, when um, Erica comes, I mean, she and I've had uh, you know, a few conversations, but, you know, we're both very interested in ethics, certainly because of what she went through. And there, here she is. Hi, Erica. Thank you for coming today. <clears throat> Hi, Linda. How's it going? Good, good. So I was just telling uh, the students a little bit about uh, how we met, how uh, you're on the advisory board and a little bit about ex your experience and how uh, we were, you know, how we came together because we're both interested in ethics, you because of your experience and me because of my life experience in general. So <clears throat> I sent the students several articles to read so that uh, they would get a little bit of a background of what happened with Theranos. I sent them your TED talk. Oh. I don't. Yeah, I, I don't know if they've had a chance to watch it. Sorry, because I did send it over the weekend and I didn't put it into their like usual uh, module. I so. also, I prepped a, a little bit of a talk. It, okay. It'll probably take me like a minutes. A lot of it is kind of the TED talk, at least certain red flags. I kind of modified a That's little fine. bit of it uh, for this That's audience because I know um, yeah. it'll be easier to talk to you guys in depth a little bit more of, about the experience and everything else than a TED talk is pretty uh, strict with its construction. Um, so um, did you want me, me to go over the talk or did you want to? Um... Let me let me just take care of some housekeeping here. Perfect. For example, uh, like I do like people to turn on their videos at least when they first come in. <laughs> so uh, Zane, Aaron, ja Jay, uh, Please come say hi, Kushik, Miguel, thank you, Louis. I don't make them keep it on because I know sometimes it's necessary to preserve bandwidth. <clears throat> Dietri, Kushik, did you turn yours on yet? Or, I, you know, keep it on until at least I can see you guys. <laughs> okay. Give me a yeah, moment, Dion. Skyler, Jay. Right. Fiza, I'd like to introduce you to Fiza, who's uh, an intern with the center. And okay. these students are all doing an internship. And so we're covering a lot of different uh, uh, topics and, and areas. And there was this great article I found on uh, Wired about how the whole Theranos uh, Elizabeth Holmes case had been mansplained. Had you seen that one? I think I may have seen this one. I haven't, okay. I haven't. Yeah. yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was interesting. In any event, please, uh, let's please welcome Erica, give her a hand. Thank you. Thank you, Erica, for coming to speak. All right, guys, I'm going to attempt to, am I able to share my screen? Uh, you know what, I'm going to make you a co-host, hold on, okay. and you'll be able to do that. Make a co-host, yes. There you go. Okay, beautiful. Let me, let me try this. So it's exciting to be talking to you guys. My brother actually goes to UC Santa Cruz. So uh, oh. I'm up there quite frequently. You guys are lucky to be on a pretty gorgeous campus. And I know it's a bit of a strange time now. So some of you might not be there, but hopefully, hopefully you guys will be back uh, 
in the next upcoming semesters. Um, so today I figured it would be good to kind of just uh, share a little bit of an intro into my story. I know you guys did some background readings, but I just want to make sure that everyone is kind of on the same page of, uh, of knowledge. So I'm just going to run you through the kind of um, kind of personal journey that I went through in my own process of examining numerous ethical dilemmas and then trying to figure out while I was roughly about all your guys's ages what I could do about it. Um, so I kind of want to transport you guys back in time to not that long ago to about 2013 and 2014 and this was the height of the Silicon Valley. Everyone was flocking from all over the world to work for one of the big tech companies. Everyone's making money. You know, it's so popular and so big that there's satires being made from it, like the TV show Silicon Valley. There's even an aesthetic, you know, everyone's running around, Patagonia vest on with their company sweater. They're all birds on. Like it's really this strong culture and community that at that point in time, everyone really wanted to be a part of and wanted to get in the action. So during this time, there were no female founders actually who were a part of this unicorn club, but there was about to be this sort of rising star and this was Elizabeth Holmes of uh, Theranos. So I wanted to, again, going through this journey of trying to transplant you back in that time, show you a brief clip of her that was probably one of the only available videos of her uh, during this time, because the company, when I started working for it, was in stealth mode. So you couldn't really find much information about it. Let's see if this works. Um... Uh, then it's about finding people who believe in you because the worst possible thing in the world is to have someone who doesn't believe in you backing you because that's not going to result in a good situation. Um, and uh, I mean, the first time that, that I went through the process of raising money, I assumed that I was going to have to talk to at least 200 people before I found one who was going to believe in me. So I didn't really care if people were turning me down because I knew I would find someone who did. Um, how do you make people believe in you? How do you make people believe in you? Um, you know, I think you have to believe in yourself. And I think you have to have the conviction in yourself to be able to make something happen. Because ultimately, it's up to you. And um, when you have that level of conviction, you'll find the people or the resources or the tools uh, that you need to make it happen. It, it may take a lot longer than you think, but it's about keeping that conviction in yourself. So I think this is a really powerful clip because Elizabeth was 19 when she said this. And it kind of goes to show you the kind of character and the charisma that this person possessed. And just in this statement of getting people to believe in you, uh, Elizabeth got a ton of people to believe in her and not just any people she got some of the most high profile uh you know politicians military officials uh and business people to believe in her so some of the people that she had on her board of directors were george schultz and henry kissinger who uh uh and also james mattis um and then also in her pool of investors where she raised 700 million us dollars in total were from people like Larry Ellenson, the Walton family, and Betsy DeVos. And there was one other person that also believed in her, and that was me. You know, I'd heard this story. I'd uh, read this one other Wall Street Journal article that was written about her. And as a recent grad coming out of Berkeley for my undergrad degree, I was really impressed by her. I was like, wow, this person had really worked hard to build up a company in blood diagnostics. And I was a like burgeoning scientist where we could potentially provide accessible and affordable blood diagnostics for people. Like, why wouldn't I want to sign up for this? And so I did. And I came in as a entry level lab associate into the company. Um, and just to kind of give you guys a bit of a primer on what the company did, 
So Theranos was a blood diagnostic company. And what they were trying to do is instead of doing a venous draw for all their blood diagnostic tests, you do a finger stick. And so they were allowing patients to go into Walgreens centers to basically order various labs. They get a finger prick. You would put this little tiny vial into a machine that was about the size of a printer. It would process for a while and it spit out the results on your phone. And this is a pretty big deal. Um, I don't know if many of you are familiar with diagnostics, but the sort of decentralized way of this operating is, is pretty cutting edge. And um, even the notion of offering price transparency for your blood diagnostics, at least at that time, was something that people hadn't really encountered in the US at least. So, you know, where did things go wrong? How did she go from being on the cover of Fortune and Forbes and Inc and being celebrated as this, um, you know, hero of a person uh, to then becoming one of the largest tech scandals in, in US history. And I'll kind of share with you guys my sort of perspective on it. And I think if you are building a biotechnology company and you're just in research and development and toying around in the lab, that's fine. But I think where Theranos started to go wrong was when it struck up this deal with Walgreens, where now they were opening in Walgreens all across America where they had to promise that the device that they had built would have to be sent into these Walgreens and they'd have to start testing thousands of patients a day versus the couple, basically a couple. They were only testing maybe like five or 10 at the time when I started working there. And I think the pressure from this deal is really when you started to sort of get into a territory that the actions that they were able to get away being scientists toying in a lab were no longer acceptable as, as time went on. So what were some of the key red flags? Me, entry level, lab associate, what did I start paying attention to? Well, the first thing that I started to notice was when I would sit in a lab meeting, we would be going over data to see, okay, is this test for you know, let's just say it was COVID, you know, some sort of infectious disease. Is this test accurate or not? So we'd look at data sets like this and we'd sit down and the lead scientist would say, oh, well, take out that outlier. So I'd say, well, which one, which one is the outlier? And if I asked you guys in here to pick out the outlier, what, what would you guys think? Do you guys have any, any thoughts of what it would be? The, the, don't, don't be shy guys. Yeah. 70,000 maybe? 70,000? Oh, sorry, 90,000 actually. 90, so the real answer is, is you have no idea, right? You don't know. And typically you want to keep everything because you, you can't, there's no good way to really measure what is an outlier in this case. You have to just keep the integrity of all the data because then it can start to tell you you know, are, is it the case that 90,000 is actually the norm? But for whatever reason, when I ran these three samples, it just didn't come out that way. There's no way to really tell. So what I started noticing is that these lab associates were, or these, the, the, the head scientists were deleting all this information to basically make sure that the accuracy was in the 90 percentile or to make sure that there's something called precision. And there's all these other metrics that you have to hit in order to get FDA approval were within the range of acceptable by regulators. Well, a consequence of this is when I had transitioned from sitting in these R&D meetings to now being in charge of integrating these devices that we had seen in R&D into a clinical setting, I had to now test real patients. So before you test a real patient, you'll typically get uh, something called a quality control. And what this is, is you have a sample, you know the concentration and you run it and you hope you get that same concentration, simple concept. So I'm, I'm trying to get a sample that's 20 micrograms per mil for vitamin D, but I'm running it in the Theranos device and it comes out 150. So this means that this patient would be overdosing on vitamin D. I get it again and it's two micrograms per mil. <laughs> 
So it means that it has, this person has to consult a doctor that they're probably deficient in vitamin D. And then I run it again and it's normal for vitamin D. So again, I run into a scenario where I'm getting all this variability and how do I know what's the right answer? Well, there, there's no, there's no good way. I know the right answer in this case. I know it's 20 micrograms per mil, but I keep running it and it's coming out all, all crazy and all psychotic. And this is not the case just for vitamin D. This was happening for pro, like cancer, cancer diagnostics, infectious disease diagnostics, like everything. <laughs> we were having these issues with, again, samples that I knew the concentration. I knew what the right answer was, but in a patient context, you don't necessarily know what that is. So I, you know, being the, you know, workaholic that I am, I, I did these experiments and many other experiments. I sort of collected this evidence and, you know, I had basically been showing it to them to say, Hey, you know, I don't think this is good to be testing on patients right away. And when we would do these experiments, we would have these comparable studies where we would show the Theranos device and something called a uh, the uh, predicate method, but it's really just the machines that are already used in the hospitals today. And we would do these side-by-side -side comparisons and they would come out radically different. And what Theranos had done, instead of sending the Edison devices, which they were testing on patients, they sent it from the FDA approved machines. And of course they passed the sort of uh, testing in order to get their certifications and their licenses. So it was clear to me, okay, even internally in this company, we don't trust our results. We're going with the machines that are already in existence to talk to regulators and interface with them. So, so what's going on here? You know, it's not the case that they don't understand that there's issues with this machine, that all this evidence that I have been collecting is not being communicated to them. They're making decisions to suggest that they don't even trust this device. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, saw all these behaviors and I went up to the COO. I talked to the medical director, I talked to the lab director, I talked to a whole bunch of reports, but finally went up to the COO and I told them, hey, um, I love working for this company, I love the mission, but at this point, I don't think we should be testing on patient samples and we're seeing a lot of issues and a lot of errors. And he basically says, you're what, a recent grad? Uh, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Have you ever taken a statistics class? You need to do the job I pay you to do and process patient samples at all cost. And that, that was Sonny Balwani, right? Yeah, that was Sonny Balwani. So at this point I was pitted in a, a really tough position, right? I went into this company because I wanted to provide affordable and accessible healthcare for people. And to know that I, my only job was to test people with a medical, like with a diagnostic kit that I didn't trust that I wouldn't give to myself. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't live with the reality of, of, uh, doing that to other people, right? If I can't give it to my brother, if I can't give it to my sister, if I can't give it to my family members, I have no business giving it to anyone else's family members was my opinion. So that uh, night, I had actually befriended a colleague of mine in the organizations, Tyler Schultz, who's also known as, as one of the key whistleblowers in this case. And I called up Tyler because I knew he had been talking. As I talked to Sonny, he was talking to Elizabeth. And I would said, hey, uh, can I come with you to your grandfather's house, who was on the board of directors, to basically let him know I think there will be power in numbers if I come and talk to him about some of the issues, especially because I was in the clinical lab. Tyler was more in R&D. And so we go to George Schultz's house and we tell him like, hey, what they are telling you is not actually what's happening. And when you think that you're getting your blood drawn and it gets put in the device, you get spit out an answer. What's really happening is they're shove, you know, taking that blood sample out of the machine. They're running it to a back laboratory and we have like six different devices that are all competing off of this tiny little vial of blood with like seven, eight different people <laughs> trying to process it. And they're not even accurate. They're not even precise. They're all these, they're just completely error ridden. And he gives me a similar response of, uh, you seem very smart, but I brought in a lot of smart people into this case. And um, they say that this is gonna revolutionize healthcare. 
that this is the next big thing. So maybe you should look for a job uh, elsewhere. So I do, I quit. I, I basically, after talking to the COO and talking to uh, the board, I was like, I can't do this. Like, I just um, can't fathom this. It was funny because George had went on this like side tangent about integrity before we had gotten dinner and talking about how at the end of his life, the only thing that he's found important is that he can maintain his integrity. And I'm crying, right? I'm at this house, like one of the nicest houses I've ever been to in my life. <laughs> Going to say, you know, basically to this man who's invested, you know, hundreds, probably millions of dollars into this company and is on the board and technically has fiduciary duty too, that like, you know, it's all a scam. Um, but uh, yeah, that stuck with me, that conversation of integrity and, and hence, hence why I left. Um, my kind of saga didn't stop there. I uh, had, you know, was trying to figure out what to do. I ended up getting contacted by a journalist and the journalist said, hey, you know, this is what I've heard about Theranos. I, um, despite having signed an NDA, I did did talk to a journalist and I also subsequently filed a report with regulators with CMS because after I had um, basically talked to the Wall Street Journal reporter initially uh, Theranos went on this huge witch hunt and basically were threatening to sue a whole bunch of former employees myself included. Uh -huh. Erica yeah. CMS that is the Center for Medicare and Medic. Medi-Cal uh, services. Did I lose you? I, I, I'm sorry. Okay, thanks. That's okay. Not everybody. All right. Yeah. For Medicare, Medicare and Medi-Cal services. Thanks. So to give you guys context, the people who regulate over lab diagnostics is uh, Medicare and Medi-Cal. And so all the lab diagnostics are not regulated by the FDA. They're regulated by um, CMS. Um, so, so yeah, so I wrote a letter to CMS it was good I did, and I figured that out because it sparked an investigation that proved that there are major deficiencies all across Theranos' lab, that I wasn't just um, not being a team player, uh, <laughs> that it was true, and uh, it stopped them from processing patient samples, and they had to revoke like tens of thousands of, of patient samples, and um, yeah, it's, it's interesting coming at the tail end of this saga and this experience, because I think a lot of people have always claimed that the reason Theranos failed was because of a product failure. They just didn't have the product. And so that's why they weren't successful. But what I would really argue is that the reason Theranos failed is because of ethical failures. They had some of the best partnerships in the country. They had more money than majority of other startups could even fathom. They could have bought out technology. Uh, they had an immense amount of clout and influence and, and just uh, fame in a certain way. But it was really because of these small decisions of deciding to overlook unethical behavior that I really think that this led to, to their collapse. And there's this great book that's helped it was, it, I've been looking at these different models of how you can frame an ethical collapse. And Marianne Jennings came out with this book called The Seven Signs of Ethical Collapse. And Theranos like hits all the markers, you know, pressure to maintain numbers. They were opening in Walgreens, fear and silence. They had to sign NDAs before we, when we interviewed for the company, right? If, if you are interviewing for a company, they make you sign an NDA, you should be a little concerned. Unless you're working for the government, it's very bizarre for that to happen. You know, uh, the staff was very young. Even though some people would claim Theranos had a weak, uh, a strong board, we really had a weak board when it comes to a biotech company. Um, conflicts of interest, Sonny and Elizabeth were dating. There was all sorts of crazy internal uh, weirdness going on, uh, innovation like no other. Um, you know, essentially they were saying, well, you know, this is going to be the next big thing. So we can sacrifice, you know, these administrative bureaucratic processes because, you know, we're not, we're in a category of our own. That's, you know, those rules don't apply to us. Uh, and then goodness in some areas of Tony for Eel and others. We were in healthcare. 
you know, healthcare is probably one of the most benevolent endeavors that majority of there's consensus amongst people from all different backgrounds that people can go in. So um, I think it grant, garnered a lot of moral licensing uh, to, to do a lot of, a lot of bad things in their mind. Maybe, I don't know. I still can't understand why she made the decision she did, but it's a different topic. So I wanted to just talk to you guys on something that I think is important. So during uh, one of the aspects of this is fear and silence and uh, Theranos uh, above majority of other organizations did a lot to induce a culture of fear and to silence its employees so much so that they hired one of the top corporate lawyers in the US to come after me. They hired private investigators to follow me the reason I, I show this as a case example is uh, I had moved out of my apartment and I was sleeping on my coworker's couch and no one knew where I was living because I was sleeping on my couch and I was traveling every weekend. I, I uh, had like a weird living situation. And on this letter from David Boys was my coworker's address. And it freaked me out because my own mother didn't even know where I was living at this point. So it was very clear to me that they were following me because uh, no one knew this address. It was just basically I was crashing on my, my friend's, friend's couch. Um, so, you know, you, you have to be careful with these sort of retaliations and understand that even if you get a big scary lawyer letter, it doesn't mean that you're subpoenaed to go to court. So just know that this is my, my pro tip doesn't mean you have to lawyer up yet. It doesn't mean anything. It just probably means that they're trying to scare you. Um, so, oh yes, I, I uh, was orienting this towards, uh, towards people who are interesting in creating and fostering speak up cultures. But one of the things that's been interesting about being retroactive th about this is, you know, why, why do people become whistleblowers and why do people become, why do people decide to, to speak up? And one of the psychological underpinnings for this is that whistleblowing is sort of this extreme uh, pro-group behavior. And it's a type of identity fusion where whistleblowers feel directly connected on a very visceral sense to the group that they're working for. And there's this sense that, you know, even if the actions that the whistleblower takes comes at a personal cost, it's ultimately for the greater benefit of the group. You know, you could arguably see this with someone like Edward Snowden, who felt like it was a big personal cost to him to release all this information, but it was ultimately for the benefit of the American people to understand when their privacy was being violated without their consent. And because of his actions, now we have widespread encryption on the internet. So that is, that's a pretty big, um, you know, impact to, to sort of have. But on the flip side, you know, why do people fail to speak up and why why do you get so many bystanders so there tends to be something called the bystander effect and the bystander effect is when one when a group of people see the same bad incident happen the more people who are actually observing the same bad thing they tend to report less because there's a diffusion of responsibility that occurs because people are like well someone else took care of it so for example when people see car accidents the more and more people that observe a car accident, the less and less likely each of those individuals are able to, are going to call 911 because they thought someone else already called 911. But there are also three other core factors that prevent people from speaking up. And that's really because a lot of people feel like if they report, nothing's gonna happen. What's the use? This is just gonna be a big pain for no change in foreseeable outcome. Uh, they're scared of retaliation which in my case, that was, that was a very clear consequence of um, something that I had done. And then also social rejection, right? Being told by others, like you're not being a team player or that you are ostracized by other people that you feel like an outsider, like that can have a really um, uh, kind of repellent effect of, of people coming forward when they when they see something wrong. So I kind of wanted to give you guys this framing. You can ask for the questions just to sort of see. I think, you know, in, in my mind, you know, mistakes are going to be a fact of life. Um, it's the response to those errors that really that really count. And, and I think 
not only in my own story, but also in the story and saga of Theranos, this was really the case that we can all find mistakes to be forgivable. But, you know, I think it's the continual lack of response to those mistakes in a proper way that really makes people um, kind of repulsed by, by other people's actions. So that's all I have for you guys. I love q and I'm pretty good about being open with any and candid with any questions. So feel free to shoot anything uh, that that you would like. Go ahead and unmute yourselves. I have questions, but I want to let others go first. Um, what did you, like, what was your next job after? My next job after? I ended up being an R&D associate for a contract research organization in the Silicon Valley. So I was off the record for a long time. So I think it didn't really affect my ability to get a job following that because um, I didn't go on the record until fairly recently. Um, but uh, it was basically a research associate. I worked in tangentially related to diagnostics and immunotherapies. Um, and then after that, I, I moved to Hong Kong and I launched a tech accelerator out there. So I, I kind of had a bizarre change and pivot in career. Did you end up getting sued? No, no, because it was all, <laughs> it was all intimidation. Um, no, I have been subpoenaed several times in order to be the witness for various cases against Theranos, but uh, I've never had to get a lawyer. I, it was all kind of empty threats. One of the things that is probably good for all of you guys to know is when a company sues an individual, that information goes into the public record. And so I think in the case of Theranos, if they had sued a 22 year old, oh my God, really? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there would have been very big question marks of why they were suing this 22 year old. So just as I had to be cautious about not getting sued, they had to be cautious about suing. And they can send whatever threatening letters that they want, but you are not required to lawyer up and show up to court until you are subpoenaed. And that's it. So that's, that's a bit of a, a, a if I was, <laughs> these are things that you shouldn't know when you're a student, but would have been very helpful for me to know in, in that context. And in which I, I, I found out, um, I, I luckily found out from talking to a lawyer not one I hired, but who was being helpful. Okay. What's a tech uh, accelerator in Hong Kong? What, do you, what did you do? The tech accelerator? Uh, essentially what we did was, um, it, it was kind of, I don't know if you're familiar with Y Combinator. So it was an early stage tech accelerator. What you do is you give upfront capital to various tech companies that apply to your program you run them through a four month, we did a four month program and um, you take equity within those companies that you run through there. Uh, we initially did them with companies all across Southeast Asia, a uh, little bit of Oceania, some US companies, but mostly that were oriented towards serving, servicing the APAC market. And we've heavily started being in logistics because Hong Kong is a big logistics hub. Very. Uh, have you been able to, uh, uh, sorry, I, I didn't interrupt. Is, did you have another, okay. Uh, did you have to try and raise seed funding for that or? I came into it when the money was already. Oh, sorry, Linda, just a little choppy. When the money, oh. That's okay. I'm going to turn off my video for a minute so to preserve bandwidth. Uh, <clears throat> I um, some I've heard. Oh well, it seems to me sometimes women have trouble getting funding for startups. Yep. Uh, have you? Uh, what's your been your observation or experience on that? Uh, if any, <laughs> uh, there's like the good and the bad and the ugly with this content. <laughs> This question. Oh, that's great. No, yeah. that's great. Um, so I think uh, in terms of, so there have been a lot of initiatives, 
part of the reason I worked for the accelerator because is because I wanted to fundamentally understand why certain things got invested versus others, where right. I saw a lot of good technologies not get invested in over good charismatic people who didn't have good technologies who got invested in and what was why was that disparity exists? Why did that disparity exist? Um, I think you part of the issue that you have amongst venture capital is this intro only way of getting access to various companies. So friends, mm -hmm. a lot of venture capitalists will invest in people who went to their same schools or mm -hmm. who were friends with them in their football club or were associated with their families. So you do get a lot of that sort of insular capital fundraising that I think makes it very hard when historically the people who started businesses were all men, it makes it very hard for women to infiltrate sometimes these kind of closed circles gatherings. Um, I think there have been a ton of initiatives to increase capital that's being uh, available to women, but there's still a long way to go. You, I, it's, it's one of those things that you have to always ask yourself what's, what's sort of the issue. There's a lot of complaints that um, there are enough female founders. I just don't think that's necessarily the case. I think there are plenty of female mm -hmm. founders. Um, and it's also one of those things when female founders are chronically not getting invested in, they tend to close down their companies much sooner because they're not able to sort of sustain the businesses that they've had. Um, that's starting to change though. That's starting to change. I think within the last probably like the last five years, six years, you, you have a, a quite a few of um, really, uh, really strong female led companies that have been able to, to sort of um, rise the ranks in certain ways. There have been better initiatives to make VCs diversify how they um, engage with different types of companies. Um, also, I think another scary thing, and this was really rampant amongst the VC community, is there's strong controls to prevent sexual harassment and assault in VC meetings. There was a very clear kind of gross power dynamic amongst female founders and kind of male investors, and that really needed to be reconciled and resolved. Um, you had, you know, 500 startups, the big scandal with uh, one of the head partners there where um and you will see this i think it's uh, uber uber was one of them wasn't it uber had a ton of issues in terms of the way in which they handled reports of sexual harassment amongst internally with amongst their employees and they had like this one predatorial person that was able to just like continuously and repeat offend Yep. Uh, and then also in terms of the complaints from their drivers, they were, they really failed to address um, those issues. Um, uh, Zane has his hand up. Yeah, Zane. Uh -huh. Okay, so this really isn't really about what you were, like, what you came here to talk about, but That's I was right. just wondering whether you could talk about, like, the culture between here and, like, Hong Kong. Oh, the difference in the culture. Yeah. Um, like, specifically, like, work culture. Ooh. Uh, we have it very easy here. Um, that is, uh, first, you work way more uh, in Asia. You you work uh, way more hours. I was working, I was working a lot when I worked in the Silicon Valley as well. But I think that's just my nature. But you um, tend to work from nine to, I guess, eight p.m. Uh, six days a week in in Hong Kong. Uh, the work culture, okay, so there are a couple of different things you can do. People work longer hours. Uh, the tech ecosystem is not really well built out in Hong Kong, I would say. It's still kind of like a, a it was a burgeoning tech center, but with the protest in addition to COVID, um, in addition to sort of the uh, security law that was passed and the sort of flight of a lot of international companies from Hong Kong because of the sort of power play that China put over Hong Kong recently. Um, it sort of shifted things a bit. Uh, I think when it comes to uh, 
diversity, the, the composition is different. You know, majority of the people are going to be either from mainland China or from Hong Kong. It's just the demographic shift. You get a lot of people from South, South uh, Asia as well. Um, uh, they, it's not as, as formalized as the US is, right? It's a lot less regulated. Um, but Zane, more specifically, what were you interested in the sort of differences in the work culture? Uh, honestly, I was just kind of curious of, as to how specifically like the power or, or like the struggle that's going on in Hong Kong like affected it, but you kind of addressed that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it's weird. A, a lot of companies that were working in Hong Kong were already interfacing with China. So I don't think they were, there was as much um, migration as people had anticipated because people had already wanted to do business with China that were in Hong Kong. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think when it comes to the ability to speak up to, there are not nearly as many channels uh, in Hong Kong and there are not as many regulatory bodies that you can kind of turn to like there is in, in the US. We have way more uh, protections for people, I would say here in the US than you would, um, you would there. Thank you so much, that answered everything. Um, <clears throat> Erica, you had spoken, when we had spoken, we talked a little bit about how we, uh, you know, when you first started working with Elizabeth Holmes, how exciting it was, you know, to have a woman as a role model. And then after what happened, uh, you know, well, how did that have, what kind of impact did that have? I mean, it's, it's awful, right? Because, because you realize, uh, you realize how, um, so there, I, I was excited. Here's kind of my, my thesis on this. If it is the case that I'm a woman who is trying to start a biotechnology company, I have a 90% failure rate because the science doesn't work out. I have a 90% failure rate because um, the company just doesn't work. And in addition to that, I have to convince an investor who's never actually backed a successful female founder that I'm going to be the exception. And that is just really hard odds to be fighting up against. And so Elizabeth as a role model to me was, it was like, okay, people will have that figure that they can turn to where other investors will look and see, you know, we should be diversifying. We shouldn't be so discriminatory when we're making, you shouldn't be the thing that just like, like invest in like, like diversity is important. And so to have that, not one, ha have it then kind of weaponized in a way of how people shouldn't invest in female founders was really, really devastating to me and really hard, oh, yeah. right? Oh. Uh -huh. Because I think it was, it, I think what was more apparent was how deep the discrimination is, where there are so many of these male fraudsters that get away with what they're doing, but we don't say men need to stop being businessmen. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. But when, it, when actually it's something like 70% of all corporate crimes are, are done by men, that could be because they're sort of dominating force. But I think uh, it was it was it was heartbreaking, right? It was heartbreaking for so many different reasons. It was heartbreaking because of all the stuff that happened with the patients. It was heartbreaking because I knew that this was going to take a blow to the point of care diagnostics industry for a while. It was heartbreaking because it was just another point for women to say and like kind of wince a little bit because people would come up to them and say, "How do I know you're not the next Elizabeth Holmes?" And oh God, yeah. There, there was. It was just adding to the layers of complication of of really um, factors that really took away from the sort of merit of of what what people were working on. Because um, when you look at the numbers, I think during that time, it was like thirty six unicorns and zero had female founders yeah. in two thousand thirteen, or there was yeah zero of them. Yeah. So, um, uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'd like to ask you about a little bit about ethics and entrepreneurship and, you know, tell the class that, you know, I found you and, can, you know, we've connected and we hope to continue to work together. But let me see if there's any other questions. 
Yeah. Come on, guys. I know. Go ahead. I was just wondering, like, where is Elizabeth Holmes now? Like, what is she? Does she get in trouble? Like, <laughs> so uh, she has been postponing the trial uh, for it's we're now going on the second year. Um, so the first time that she was supposed to be tried, uh, it's a federal case. Um, yeah, I think it was almost two years ago. It was almost two years ago. So this is a strategy that the lawyers will pull because it's such a high profile case to have it leave the memories of potential jury members. They'll keep trying to push it and push it and push it and push it. Delay, delay, delay. Yeah. Um, so I but honestly, she, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, she's she's facing like, I don't know how many charges of fraud, quite a few. Yeah, it's this is something that's interesting about the justice system though, that I didn't realize. The worst thing you can do in the US is wire fraud. Um, so in terms of like the most unethical thing you can do, it's basically pocketing your investor's money into your own pocket. Um, and the list of charges in terms of endangering the public and potentially killing people for like severe and repeated negligence. It's like the 14th charge. It just blows my mind of what uh, like our priorities are in this country, but, uh, mm -hmm. but it, 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 yeah. So, so that's the first thing that she's, she's being charged with and uh, Wire fraud. About, yeah. I think 18, 18 other counts. Yep. That's what I remembered. 18. Yeah. yeah other counts but uh, you know the lifestyle uh, the fact that she and uh, her co-founder were living high uh, you yep. know a very high uh, fast-paced lifestyle yeah they were paying she had the company like pay for her security guards to pay for like a rental in the like some atherton house uh, there were lots of ways in which she was able to sort of get the company to pay for her own, her own things. Okay. Did any of the other, uh, did any of your uh, coworkers kind of feel the same way that you did or were you alone? You, a lot of people had believed that the technology didn't work or it didn't work well, especially us in the lab. Um, I don't, uh, like, like, did any of them question it? Like, did anyone like actually like kind of come up like you did and actually like, you know voice their concern so some people had voiced their concern it was kind of like a bell curve of people the voicing of the concern never got pushed far enough i would say uh there were a there was actually a small collective so in terms of the people who reported to the wall street journal there was a small collective of people it's often just said i think in the very beginning people thought it was just tall tyler but it wasn't it was actually like a small group of us that came to forward to the Wall Street Journal. In terms of people who reported to regulators, I think there was me and one other person. One other person had reported, I believe, to the FDA. Um, so uh, it there were people, but it's just hard. It's hard to know what to do. You're again in this sort of culture of fear and secrecy that's reminding you every, you know, few months that you signed an NDA that you can't post what you do. Uh, non sorry, non-disclosure agreement. I just want to make sure they get nice non-disclosure yeah, non agreement. agreement. <clears throat> so and, uh, go ahead. Sorry, Linda. Another another tip that I, I would like to tell you guys, because I imagine some of you will work for, for tech companies. If you see someone commit uh, an actual crime, your NDA does not apply. You are allowed to, to know. Report. You're allowed to report. Just, just know that. Um, the, there's a, a question from Melissa Thomas, one of our guests. Melissa, what would you like to ask? Actually, I have a comment for Erica. I just, I was aware of you before today and Linda invited me because you are one of our great heroes. Oh. And I just wanna say that I think that if we're looking for women who are powerful, amazing role models for, for my daughter and even for the old women like Linda and myself, you are our role model of ethical living. And there's no doubt in my mind that you saved lives by your actions because it would have only been a matter of time until a death happened. And I just adore you. And I want you to know that there's a whole community rooting for you and cheering for you and holding you in our hearts. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you, Melissa. That's very kind. That's very, very nice. sweet, Melissa. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, do you know like how your name got uh, like eventually got leaked? Did you ever yeah. find that out? Yeah, I did. This is not a very happy day for me. Um, so oh. I remember it quite well. Uh, sorry, I, I meant like. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just meant like. Uh, I know like. Like how, yeah, anyway, okay, never mind. I didn't have anything to add. If, if you don't mind answering it, yeah. I don't mind, yeah, no, I don't mind answering it. I had gotten subpoenaed for a court case. So more private investigators came to <laughs> visit me in Hong Kong. I got subpoenaed for a court case for an investor lawsuit. And the judge for that investor lawsuit decided to open up the court case for everyone to read, even though it was a private lawsuit. So I woke up one day uh, and got a bunch of emails and said, Erica, your name's in Bloomberg in the SF Chronicle and had no idea why. And essentially the report had said that I had reported to the CDC and said all this other stuff that just was not, um, a, not an accurate nor truthful representation of things that I had done. So uh, after basically thinking that it was uh, uh, John that had done it, I basically um, found out it was because the judge had decided to release the record from this particular court case that I was involved in. And that's how I went on the record. And people yeah. said, you either own your story or you let them own it. And that's why I sort of kind of took full command, even though I'm I'm not a big fan of, of being in the spotlight. I'm, I'm way too introverted. Uh, for it to be comfortable for myself, so. Yeah, Nyla, it's like, how is that even allowed? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> judges have a lot of power <laughs> to do those kinds yeah. of things. Yeah, it's worked out in my benefit though. I think I was being a bit too, I think, because uh, I, I was very scared of these people for a very long time. And now because I'm in the public record that does offer some level of protection that I think I would have mm -hmm. never been cognizant of if it hadn't happened. Um, I think more damage could have, in the event of bad things happening to me in the future, which is still not off the table because I just don't fundamentally trust these people. Um, uh, I might have more protections because of just the, the high profile nature of the, the case and being on the record. So we'll find out. Okay. Uh, one other question. Any other questions? Um, how long were you afraid of some sort of retribution? And do you think like that is past? Um, I think once CMS had conducted the investigation, that was a big sigh of relief. Like, okay, what you were saying was valid. The concerns you had are were backed by evidence. And that was... Um, sort of a good position to be in. I think when the company went under, that was another sort of sigh of relief. Mm -hmm. um, but I think my next sigh of relief will come when the court case is done, because this is something I did back in 2014, you figure. So for me, it's been the entirety of my, my 20s has been attributed to this case. And it's hard wow. to know like what the repercussions are. And I think when you're dealing with people that do come from wealth and power and money, and in certain ways, I know that she's probably been ostracized. I, I don't think that she has. I think uh, what ends up happening is she ends up still being friends with a lot of powerful people within the Silicon Valley. She does. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so, oh, oh, it's it's really it's really uh, sad. It really yeah. is. And in fact, there was some pardon my language bozo who had written about how we should still look up to her. Oh, to Draper. Yes, yeah. yes, it was yeah. yes, Draper who said, oh, she's a hero and uh, white feminism. <laughs> that's one, that, yeah, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's sort of a disturbing way to put it. Wow, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it, I, I, can, uh, I can appreciate that, but, um, and okay, any other questions before I uh, ask er Erica 
uh, to talk a little bit about um, how the ethics ethics and entrepreneurship dot org came out of this. I'm sorry, the what? Uh, <laughs> Erica and Tyler and I, I don't know if there were who the other co-founders uh, started an organization called ethics in entrepreneurship dot org. Do you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about that, Erica? Yeah, so essentially, so I co-founded this with this uh, uh, another person I had known, this guy, Luke. Um, somehow, Luke. Oh, right. yeah, somehow it got, I didn't co-found it with Tyler, but he's on the I'm advisory sorry, yeah. board. I think there's some sort of article that has, has made conflated this, that. Conflated yeah. that. Um, but essentially, uh, after the experience working at Theranos and seeing how basically when young organizations don't pay attention to ethics, what the worst case scenario of that could look like in having worked with a lot of early stage startups while I was in Hong Kong. Um, it kind of made me realize that we needed to figure out a way for people to embed ethical questioning, to foster ethical culture and to design ethical systems for tech startups. And the earlier that this sort of sentiment was embedded in the organization, the easier it would be to stay in the long term. And that was kind of the ethos of why I decided to start the organization. I noticed that there was a lot of fragmentations on people working on these ideas, but there wasn't sort of this overarching organization that tried to aggregate everything to, to sort of facilitate that. We're a young, early organization We've taken a very slow approach, which I think in the ethics world is an appropriate approach. Uh, to yes. Start with. Um, but we'll be launching a lot of our inaugural programs probably within the next uh, within the next few quarters. So probably within the next six months, we're launching quite a few different different initiatives and programs, basically trying to figure out, you know, how when it comes to these new innovations that are exciting, that can provide a lot of benefit to the world to make sure that we're not doing that at the cost of, of public safety. Uh, and um, particularly when it comes to startups as they interface with regulated industries, I think this is a really important conversation. So that's kind of- So this is obviously one of the areas that connected us yeah. uh, because, and it actually probably was these ideas were de developing along the same time, around the same time. Well, actually, for me, as a recovering attorney, I've kind of been in the works for a while, but then moving out to California and having my own experiences out here, really, uh, you know, uh, when I heard about Eric, I reached out to her and said, hey, can we find a way, you know, to, to work together on this? And... <clears throat> because one of the things we want to do here at Crown College, obviously, is to promote ethical culture. And Erica, funny story, uh, <clears throat> I, you know I've been in contact with the Center for Humane Technology, yep. too. I think I, I've mentioned that to you. And uh, the students all know about uh, what, we're, what we're working on with the Tech Ethics Review Board, or TURBO for short. And I'd been talking to a few folks at the Center for Humane Technology about it. And, and this is a while ago, but uh, they, so the response I got was, why on earth would a tech company expose itself to this? Yeah. And, and, I, th and I thought to myself, well, this, you know what, maybe so you don't have to testify in front of Congress, but, <laughs> you know, might be one response, but then it did occur to me, as you said, you know what, this needs to be from the ground up. This needs to be starting at the very startup level. I think that's when, where we're gonna start seeing the changes in general. Yeah, yeah you're, seeing, you're seeing a pretty big wave. I, I talk about this in terms of trends too. Uh, you've noticed that there's a high emphasis placed on ethics amongst uh, Generation Z. Um, yes. And there's been a lot of reports done on this. And I think it's because of uh, uh, 
having lived in a technology uh, driven world like Generation Z has with mobile technology, there's so much more transparency, you're just inundated with all of the sort of egregious activity that kind of went on behind closed doors once upon a time ago. Um, people mm -hmm. are really uh, oriented to, towards wanting to change that because it's not sustainable. The sort it's of not. that it's we not. built in the past can't really survive in the future. Um, so what does that shift look like and what does that change look like? And, and, you know, I think it'll be a lot of you guys in this sort of class that'll, that'll really be the people who are, who are sort of changing the status quo of what, what was done before. So uh, I, I've said this to this group before, and I can't remember if I said this to you or not, but I think this group is like, is similar to the group, uh, the world's greatest generation in what they they're going through now in terms of those who grew up during the great depression out of the great depression came all these great social programs like medicare social security but it took 30 years for them to come into effect yeah it, it's going to take 20 to 30 years for this yeah. generation to come into power and make those changes so i yeah. think we're looking at the world's next greatest generation uh maya says uh mm. maya are you still here would you like to go ahead hey. and yeah, please go ahead and speak hello everyone uh, my name is maya hernandez i'm your crown college programs coordinator and before i start erica thank you for coming tonight i really appreciate you sharing this yeah. information and students i hope you really are taking note because this is what your power looks like here erica is not too much older than you versus probably the very um, wonderful, but slightly older age range that um, you and I are in, you know, like, yeah. this is cool. Thank you so much. And I also want to thank you, Erica, because I um, am from Los Angeles in what is now a health desert. And I remember back in the day, Walgreens having these machines and thinking about literally the amount of lives you did save by coming forward. So thank you. Um, so, yeah. so think, yeah, like it is mind blowing just what decisions people make of capital over human life is amazing. Um, but what I want to talk about is social fiction and some other cool things uh -huh. about you all. So how many of you received an email from me about um, received an email about Crown College events? And so we have some free events coming up. We have four movie screenings coming up and Linda, if you can copy and paste in the chat. I will, I will do that. Black Klansmen coming up. We have Harriet um, that are all free to all of you. We have up to 500 movie screenings. And fun fact, who knows who started, just a general description, who started the concept of home security in America? Like who created that invention? You can Google it real quick. And I wanna see probably some surprise faces on the screen versus what we think about African-American surveillance um, and community, those words tied together. So Black Klansman is coming up on Friday, the 26th to the 27th, and then Harriet, yes. And so Mark, tell me about Miss Marie. If I, if I can just interrupt for one second, I want, I was like, Erica needs to go on to her. Oh next Erica. meeting and Thank i you. just want to say please uh, everybody give erica a hand Yay. thank you so much yeah thank oh, you guys really thanks, really much. thanks for your comments and uh, yeah we will continue our conversation yes. uh because uh uh i really i i just reached out to rogue mm -hmm. office about this and i have some ideas anyway i'd love to run by you so i'll send you an invite for maybe like this coming friday again okay Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Thank so, you, America. Thank you, Erica. Um, and so um, we have Harriet on Sunday, which is February 28th through March 1st. And that is again, 500 free screening. So individual links sign up for that. And then we have Geekly coming up March, February 28th through March 5th. And you'll all receive emails about those events and social fiction. Who's coming, who knows about social fiction? Who's the crowny here? Raise your hand or show me your thumb. All right, yay. Okay, for those who aren't crowny, social fiction was a conference started 15 years ago out of Crown students. 
and um, Crown students um, wanted to combine what they were learning and what was once a two quarter core course with their love. And okay, think about this is like the 90s, y'all, and late 2000s, D and D and whatever video games were at the time and other tabletop games, and realizing that Crown's ethos of science and technology. Um, through the lens of social society and politics. So thinking about social justice and the different inequities and how people are lived or can live their lives um, with the help or hindrance of science and technology was how our students were processing their experience and learning um, about the science classes and how they wanna use their knowledge for hopefully good versus evil in the world. And so social fiction came out of that. Social fiction, um, then a few years later ended up being adopted by our provost office. So now it has permanent funding and social fiction conference is happening March 5th through the 7th. And I hope you all come and join. It is a free conference and the links are dropped in the chat. Um, if any of you are interested, we do have a few free social fiction, social fiction mask and geek week masks for students living both on campus and off campus. If you're living on campus, you're getting your mask very soon, Crownies, if you like a mask and you're in this class, sign up anyway and I will send you a mask. Free of charge, they're very cool. They're flip-sided, so there's two different designs and they're micro files, something. So they're a little bit better than what, you know, the cotton mask my, the target. Uh, Maya, I did ask uh, students, they are doing final presentations uh, coming up and I've said to them, Oh, actually, I'm not sure if I made this clear. I, I am pretty sure I posted this, but I wanted to remind everybody that you don't have to do uh, that as an option. You can choose to do your final project as a part of the social fiction conference. So you don't have to do it twice. If you do it at the social fiction conference as a submission, that counts as your final presentation. And, and I, I yeah, go ahead. And I will make sure you get a good time so that other oh, people good. can come. So, but we do have some it's, little outside guests from women who work in the Star Wars um, industry to cosplay players who are official cosplay people who own a company and talk about cosplay through a lens of racial and social justice. Um, we have a play by some of your peers that did your workshop play looking at, of course, pandemics, because that's on everybody's lived mind and experience this year. Um, and some other cool things. We are also screening at Social Fiction, Ready Player One, and um, Ghost in a Shell, the 1995 anime version. So, I love that anime. The anime. <laughs> yeah. So you all, I hope you get involved. Um, how many of you are crownies, by the way? Most There's Okay, few. Few. Visa, okay. Colin. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this, uh, so this class we offered to any to non crownies too. Yeah. Uh, because we're trying, you know, we're working on getting the the center uh, up oh. running. Yes. And these are these are our current um, uh, interns. All right, although Fiza and Sophia are our primary interns and uh, they're helping to lead this class and to take the center forward. And yeah, you and Maya, maybe I can, I'll send you an invite, you and I can talk later in the week too, to yeah. try and get some of the, uh, to do some synergistic work, you know? Yes. But no, thank you all. Thank you for inviting me, Linda. This was really cool. So I'm so glad. I'm so glad you came. And Thank you. She's nice to see really human good. faces beyond my Chewbacca, my project manager behind me. So <laughs> thank you all. So have a thank good you. night. Thank you. Thanks, Maya. So let me see. Melissa, so we're going to just go back to talking about she may have signed off already. Okay. Um, anyway, you're welcome to hang around or, or leave. Uh, we invited a few because uh, a few extras because uh, yeah sort of special speaker that's not an opportunity this is not somebody you're just going to bump into in the street and I'm very grateful that you came so thank you thank you Mark yeah and the thing is if you sign up for 97b 
we're going to be lining up some more. One of the programs that we would like to get running or get started at the center is have a monthly speaker come speak in the evening because I've got this fantastic network in Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, not, uh, not just women, but men and women who are willing to come and speak to our students about what kind of future they would like to create uh, and <clears throat> helping to create an ethical culture. So yeah, uh, lots of, uh, th that is definitely one of the things that we will be pursuing. Uh, and one of the questions or one of the ways is how is the best way to go uh, about doing that? And that's one of the things we'll continue to discuss, not only in this class, but in 97B and in the time to come. Did any of you sign up for Crown to present at Crown or not yet? Okay. Yeah, I'd encourage you to do that. I've put the registration in there. And Maya Hernandez, if you wanted to submit something, if you wanted to do your presentation, so your presentation would be done on a Saturday instead of during class time the following Monday. So <clears throat> it's, uh, hold on, Maya Hernandez. Let's see if I have her. She, I'm sure she put her email here. Oh, by the way, um, I had not heard about this, but this reference to the white feminist savior complex. Have you guys heard about that? Wow. Okay. That's, uh, it's not something I'm, uh, but I had heard about, but you know, that's one of the things I love about teaching at UCSC and talking to others is I get to learn all these different things too. So, and also a reminder, uh, presenting at the social fiction conference is a resume builder. It looks really good on your resume. So present as a group and you can get to put her on. Uh, also, uh, it's, it's an opportunity to get to know others in the community networking. Uh, Marina, thank you. Oh, thank you for, yeah, Maya, thank you. Okay, so there is Maya's uh, uh, email and she's offered to uh, get you a slot to present. And I really would urge you. In fact, I'm sorry, I meant to tell I meant to tell, uh, have Fiza and Sophia tell you, I get, I'll give you extra credit. I will give you extra credit for presenting at the UC, at the social fiction conference. So to encourage you. So if you need a few extra points, a little bit of a bump up, please consider doing that. <laughs> uh, let's see, anything else? It is fun and it's low pressure, really. It's, believe me, it's really low pressure. <laughs> so we just try and have a lot of fun with it, um, talk to each other. It's, it's, not, it's not formal. You don't have to, uh, yeah, you don't have to do overly formal. So any other, yeah, you present your final, you, what you do is you pick the final project, for your presentation to this class. Is that correct? You've picked a topic? Yeah. You present, instead of presenting it in class, all right, you present it at the social fiction conference. Everything's gonna be taped anyway at the social fiction conference. I'm planning on attending the social fiction conference. So, and normally, normally I give a presentation. This year, I've been so inundated with uh, grant proposals and trying to <clears throat> take care of other things. I did not have a chance to put in my own presentation, but, oh, you know what? Later in this course, in the next few weeks, I will be giving you the presentation that I gave at one of the social fiction conferences called From Corpse to Corpse, like dead body corpse to corporations, 
You get it? Okay, from corpse to corpse, legal person, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that'll be coming up, I think, in the next week or two. Uh, and you can pre, oh, okay, you can pre-record these and have, thank you, Maya, I did not know that. Uh, you can pre-record your presentation and then have a live uh, question and answer session. Uh, question and answer session, or you can present live at the conference. Either way. <clears throat> so yeah, Fiza, make sure to note to Sophia that uh, we're uh, giving students extra credit if they sign up for this too. If, if they do their final presentation. Does that answer your question, Mark? Okay. Okay. So did, I was a little concerned. Now I got, uh, I, I had met with Erica last week because uh, she was actually assisting on this proposal um, that we were talking about. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, and so I was just able, you know what, I asked her spur of the moment on Friday and she said, yes, uh, I, pro I know I can get more speakers if we have, uh, you know, give them a little bit more notice, but, uh, do you see how her talk intersected and was aligned with the readings? Okay, anybody kind of want to tie them together for us? Um, I mean, the readings, I mean, okay, they're, they're like multiple, but like one of them yeah. sort of gave like a more um, like outer view of things in like um, how, I mean, it's sort of mentioned, like she said, like the, now the fact that like, um, you know, she was like, you know, this con woman who like, um, it's like how much harder it will make like future females like you know oh becoming God, CEOs. Yeah. So uh, she did mention that, and like the reading did mention that. Um, like it gave uh, a different perspective of like um, like there's like that one fem feminist one where it's like um, she also Me. mentioned like uh, like the reading was like um, okay so rather than like these uh, female CEOs are like just these um, like them owning up to mistakes like they point out that like. Um, a man not, might not be called out on it and like um like uh also erica did sort of mention that um so like uh that was um that was the perspective mm -hmm. anybody else in the woman and tech or the woman in tech presentation slides uh they mentioned how um 56 percent of women leave originally at the mid-level um, depending on like their work experience and based on like uh, difficulty to advance in leadership roles and um, Erica's like just how she couldn't get her voice heard like that's I um, you know I didn't think that. to ask her I, I, I didn't think to ask but I couldn't help but wondering if she was dismissed partly because she was a young woman mm-hmm uh, Nihilus asks, okay, yeah, Maya says when the big, March 6th is the big day, the conference is March 5th through 7th. So, yeah, you have time and your presentations, you were going to give your presentations, I think, until that final week anyway. So, you can get it out of the way a day or two early. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, very good, Margaret, thank you. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. And uh, did you see the article about uh, toxic, the lean lean in feminism being toxic? That was one of the uh, supplemental readings I had given you. What did you guys think about that? Unfortunate about the talk about the lean in feminism. 
Uh, yes. Like, okay. um, like. Uh, do you know, uh, guys, I don't know if you know the expression, lean in was a book uh, by Sheryl Sandberg, who was, I can't even remember now, is she still the CEO of Yahoo? Do not know, but I think they mentioned that in the article. Okay. So, <clears throat> all right. So, do you guys like this guest speaker? Uh, if you if you sign up for Crown ninety seven B, would you like to see speakers like that? It's not just obviously going to be about women. Um, we have some other, we have other people. We have uh, men from different industries too. I have a film maker from uh, San Diego who would be willing to speak to the class. We've got, I have a friend who is uh, the leader of, uh, well, it's, it's Black in the Open or bito.org. So, uh, he's willing to speak. The only thing is, is he's in England and this time of the day is awful. I mean, it's something like three or 4 a.m. there. So he's not going to get up then to, to speak to everybody. But we can arrange to have, uh, we can arrange to have him speak another time. And if there is anybody would like to see speak, please drop a note uh, to me to FISA, to Sophia, and we'll see if we can get them. Because, uh, <laughs> because people really do enjoy being heard. Um, they want to inspire you. So uh, FISA, was there anything else we needed to cover this evening? Um, no, just a reminder that rough draft for the uh, blog post is due before class this Wednesday. So don't forget that. Oh, I did also want to encourage you all, if you haven't, to get a LinkedIn profile. How many of you have LinkedIn profiles? No, anybody have a LinkedIn profile? Okay, a few people. So I'm going to share my screen with you for a moment, all right? Because this is one of the things that we're doing. I kind of do, okay. <laughs> I encourage you to uh, sign up for LinkedIn and then also to sign up uh, on the link for the LinkedIn group for the center for applied ethics and uh, humanities. God, I haven't checked this in a while. So hold on. Oh, posts and activity. Here we go. So uh, we've got, although it's 165 followers we've got, we've got a lot more uh, members. Okay, super administrator view, we've got well over 1200 members. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Visitors, updates, followers, that's what I, okay. And we need to try and build that up. <clears throat> Let's see now. Hold on, super administrator view, administrative tools. Okay. Oh, I can't find the number here, but it is uh, well over 1,200 and growing. And this is where we are hoping to post some of your blog entries too. 
it's it i'll tell you when employers are looking for uh people to hire they are going to look to see what sort of so social what what do you do on social media and posting on something like the on the center for applied ethics and values shows that you are a thinker serious you're a scholar you know that you think about these things it reflects well so i would urge you all uh, to think about that and get your linkedin profile up and running apply actually we'll you know, you should be able to join without a problem. Um, I have Nyla Fayez, who's okay. The, it's called this. Yeah, let me share it with you again. If you go to LinkedIn, it is called the Center for Applied Ethics and Values in Emerging Technologies. Okay, you can see Sophia. Uh, Fiza, Nyla, myself, Chris Reed, we're all super administrators. So if you, what you do is you have to apply to be in the group, just ask if you can be admitted and one of us will admit, admit you. We don't necessarily wanna make it an open group because in the past when we had done that, unfortunately people started spamming, <laughs> putting up posts. Oh, okay. could you read? Okay, Margaret, could you see it? Or was I able to read it to you? Okay. Yeah, I got the name down. Thank you. Okay, very good. All right. Well, there's a session on Wednesday with Fiza and Sophia about your blog entries. Uh, please make sure uh, if you're if you if you want the extra credit and you know uh, sign up for the uh, social fiction conference, take a snapshot of the page and send it to Fiza, Sophia, and myself to make sure you get the extra credit and you can do your presentation then. I have a question. Sure. So February 23rd is the sign, like the deadline, the deadline for the sign up or like you have to submit the actual like presentation? No, it's just the sign up. It's just the deadline for the sign up. Okay, okay. So yeah, no, you don't have to have the presentation the, okay, okay. the cool. day of. Okay. Okay. Cool, thank you. Okay. All right. Does anybody have any other questions? If not, uh, if you do, hang around. I'm gonna stop recording. And 